Center for Women Studies and a professor of history at the University of Hyderabad. She is a renowned, a renowned accommodation, uh, academician in history and gender studies. She was the chair of the Women's World Congress in 2014, organized for the first time in India. She also authored and edited many books, most important being Devadasis in South India and the Gender Lands. She has been recently invited by the National Commission for Women to be its resource person for gender sensitization and gender development program. Now I request Madam to take the session. Hello. Please, you, you can start, Madam. Total 100 minutes are there, Madam. Please start. Yeah. So nice, uh, all of you. I hope you are me. So, you know, today I'm going to talk on uh, sexual harassment and uh, uh, let me uh, take you through it. Before I talk about uh, sexual harassment, we have to uh, understand gender violence because there is a relationship between the two. Gender violence and sexual harassment are a manifestation of our relationship and uh, women are more uh, likely to be victim of uh, both because often uh, they lack power and they are in very vulnerable and insecure uh, position. Gender-based violence is something which is directed against a person because of their gender and all of us know, you know, every day we are reading newspapers, we are looking at uh, uh, television and we Ma'am, any Could issue? That they have misbehaved. Any issue? Ma'am? Yeah. Please go ahead, madam. Please go ahead. Put on your video, ma'am. Is this second one? No one minute. The video is not good. Second icon, ma'am. Hmm? The bottom seven icons are there, ma'am, and the, from the second icon. Share, I'm getting. Ma'am, share, 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 uh, share, stop sharing. Top me, top me. Aapko start. Stop sharing ke baju ka aapko video nahi karna. Mute on video. No, there is pause showing. Okay, please continue, ma'am. Without video. Please. Madam, you can continue without the video. There is no video icon. Can you see? Yeah. Go ahead, madam. No, okay, no, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, okay, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. And um, another reason why uh, violence occurs is we have a certain notion of uh, you know how women should behave, and maybe these women have not behaved um, according to those norms. And these are norms which are decided by a patriarchal uh, society. Uh, all of us know that right from birth to old age, um, you know, many of the girls and women are uh, denied their rights. They are tormented and even uh, uh, killed. The reason why we uh, do not talk so much about violence at home is there is a big culture of silence. Many times women are keeping quiet out of fear they think about the family honor and uh, sometimes you know women think about their children and often this women think that she is the one who's responsible because she is at uh, uh, fault and in many cases women think it's a normal 
uh, thing and it is something which is uh, inevitable in fact uh, many women think that there are there's nothing they can do to escape their uh, uh, lot un came up with a declaration in 1993 and first time in this document on elimination of violence against women it defined gender based violence prior to this we really did not have any such uh, uh, definition and it says that any gender based violence is that which results or is likely to result in physical sexual or psychological harm and ultimately it leads to suffering uh, of the women it could include threats such as uh, coercion or arbitrary deprivation of liberty and it could occur in both um, public as well as private uh, places now you know i've already uh, discussed some of the reason as to why violence takes place i've already mentioned that uh, you know uh, there is a certain expectation from how girls should behave and when um, women and girls don't behave like that there, there is uh, a lot of uh, violence and again there is an understanding that uh, women have lack space in the public uh, arena i'm sure all of you have heard about this uh, campaign take back the night this is something which started in the us and uh, they said that uh, one can um, uh, you know night uh, is something which also belongs to the women all of you know that the moment it is dark many of us uh, women especially are not to be seen in public spaces so uh, take back the night was a campaign where they were trying to Uh, get back the mm, women women are seen as belonging to a different or lower uh, uh, caste and another reason for violence this is something which is very peculiar in the asian context is we have defined masculinity at the expense of uh, uh, women uh, you, what happened during partition see the muslim men uh, caught hold of hindu women they were raped they were killed their breasts were cut and hindu men caught hold of the muslim women they were raped and killed now it is not that they were taking any revenge against those women but this was a way of sending a lesson to these men saying that you are not man enough to protect your women all of you know that even today this is something which is very much prevalent if there is a caste war in any uh, village or something you know it is the women who get uh, raped and it is the women who have to bear the brunt of violence so what we have done in asian context we have defined masculinity a man's masculinity at the expense of women this is something which is very peculiar to our culture now let's come to sexual harassment uh, so now you know sexual harassment is also a kind of gender violence this name is something which was coined much later before this name was coined uh, women used to just call it life you know i brought out a book uh, um, in um, i think it was in 2010 or 12 it was published and it is called journeys into women's study and many uh, uh, women across the world have written about their experiences it's in a narrative style palgrave macmillan had published it cynthia anlo she is a leading uh, uh, activist and an academician she has done some fantastic work on feminism the iraq war um, and uh, she has also looked at palestine and other issues so in that she talks she says before uh, even uh, we gave this term sexual harassment a name we just called it life it was something that you know you are born a woman you have to deal with it and first time this term is introduced by lynn farlin in her book sexual shakedown it was published in 1978 the next year another book was published by katherine mackellan and it was called the sexual harassment of the working women now based on this you know all over the world you have key legislation and broad feminist theorization about gender relations and a lot of you know politics have helped to define this uh, term different countries have dealt with this issue in a different way sexual harassment is uh, sometimes you know it is seen as a criminal offense 
uh, and it was um, only in 1980s that in the US it got uh, uh, recognized. They brought out a um, uh, guideline in the form of an Equal Employment Opportunity um, uh, Commission. So uh, they looked at it saying that this is something which is very important for women to have equal opportunities. I'll be giving you some examples uh, further. In other countries, they have uh, looked at uh, sexual harassment as a general phenomena which occurs, and we need to have certain legal remedies. And what they have done is they have uh, um, uh, taken broad framework within the criminal law uh, procedure. In other places, in many countries, they have looked at it as a workplace phenomena, and you have a lot of civil and labor laws which are applied. In fact, Internationally, you have all kinds of laws which cover sexual harassment. Somewhere it is through uh, criminal, civil, uh, labor, or tort law. So that is how um, sexual harassment has been uh, dealt with. First time in the US, a landmark uh, judgment uh, came up. And uh, this was um, when, you know, Michelle uh, Winston. Uh, she filed a case and uh, she had joined in 1974 as a teller at a very low level in the Meritor Saving Bank. And her immediate supervisor was Sidney Taylor and he was the vice president of that bank. Now, over the next year, uh, uh, Vincent got a lot of promotion. She was promoted. You know, some of it was definitely because of her own uh, uh, merit and uh, she mm, was uh, you know promoted uh, to a higher level as a branch manager but then after four years on the pretext that she was taking too many leaves too many sick leaves her services were terminated then she filed a mm, suit against the bank and uh, she said that during her period in the bank she had faced a lot of sexual harassment. It was very interesting. This is something which we can see in India also. You know what happened in many of the cases, Bhavri Devi, etc. In the federal district court, uh, they felt that you know they she was not a victim of sexual harassment because she herself had admitted that she was she went into a sexual relationship with this uh, manager. Though she said that, you know, he would fondle me, he even raped me at times. They said, no, it was something which was done consensually by both of them. And therefore, uh, there was no misconduct on part of the bank. After this, she again went to the court of appeals um, in the district court of Columbia uh, circuit. And here in 1986, this landmark judgment came. Uh, which is known as the Vincent versus the Meritor Saving Bank um, case. And it said that, yes, there was a sexual harassment which was involved. And because of this, uh, you know, she had, uh, uh, she did not have equal opportunities to work. And it was an annulment of uh, uh, an individual right. And therefore, this court said that, that she has to uh, be given. Uh, uh, you know, the employer is liable for sexual harassment. Okay, so this was something, a very interesting case which uh, came up. Now, let me come to India. Any issue? Is it clear? Is it fine? Fine, fine, fine. Okay. You can continue. Yeah. So, what happened? Now, let's come to India. See, even in India, we had nothing like a sexual harassment uh, case earlier, but the, um, you know, Indian Penal Court did have certain sections, which was something closely to what was uh, sexual harassment. In Section 209 of the IPC, if there was any obscene act or if there were any obscene uh, songs, uh, it, would, uh, me, uh, it could lead to a punishment of three years, or it could be a fine, or both could be um, implemented. Then again, under Section 354 of IPC, that if a woman um, faced, I mean, there was an assault of criminal um, uh, force, the, or it outraged her uh, modesty, then um, there was a punishment of two years. 
again under section 509 of ipc if you know through a gesture or uh, through an act the again the modesty of women was uh, um insulted then it could lead to one year um, fine then you also had industrial dispute act uh, where you know they were looking at unfair labor practices there were certain civil loot um, civil suits under tort laws that were looking at uh, the whole um, background but there was nothing like a sexual harassment uh, uh, you know concept which was there there were certain landmark judgments which came up Uh, you know you had the radha bai versus uh, ramchandran case in 1973 she was radha bai was the secretary of the social welfare minister and uh, you know she had protested when many of these institutions you know where these girls were being kept uh, they were uh, being mistreated and when she made a complaint against this she was molested and dismissed from her service in 19 so again you know a court case was filed and in 1975 a judgment was passed in her favor she got back all her uh, salary with um, payback and all the other benefits again there was another case in 1992 by uh, sc bhatia who was a professor uh, in the department of adult and continuing education in delhi university and uh, finally you know because of this when many of these girl students came and um, registered a complaint against his behavior he was dismissed in 1992 a very well known case in india which all of us know is of rupandev bajaj and kps gill in 1988 where you know he slapped up australia and uh, in uh, 1998 um, uh, you know there was um, he was fined uh, 2.5 lakhs and um, in lieu of 3 uh, months of rigorous uh, imprisonment so we did have lot of these cases which were coming and uh, uh, but the most important case which came up and uh, that really brought in the law related to sexual harassment was by uh, bhavri devi now bhavri devi was gang raped in 1992 and um, she was a social worker in a government of uh, women's development uh, program and what happened in bhateri village where she was working as one of the you know workers of that in uh, a sevika they are called sevikas and some of these upper caste uh, people you know you have child marriages which is very common over there and uh, they were um, when these child marriages were being organized in this rajasthani village she complained she tried to stop this uh, marriages and then there was uh, you know uh, uh, she was she any issue not clear madam you, you can proceed madam no problem you can proceed okay yeah because i could hear some voices okay then you know finally what happened um, a legal battle was uh, fought and first time uh, we have um, a, a case which came up i don't know why it's called we have um, uh, you know a legal battle was uh, fought and the term sexual harassment was defined for the first time and this is something which we uh, refer to as the uh, vishakha judgment hello sir rimali really so uh, this uh, you know initially uh, the judgment came in the form of uh, vishakha guidelines and uh, in uh, you know this was something which was uh, uh, decided on 13th august 1997 and uh, based on these guidelines finally the sexual harassment of Uh, women at the workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act came into being in 2013 so you know we had our first sexual harassment act in 2013 so now you know having given you a kind of a background now let me come to this whole issue of what do we mean by sexual harassment now sexual harassment is a uh, any unwelcome sexually determined behavior it could be you know 
uh, making a physical contact, a demand for a sexual favor, or you know, it could also be a sexually colored remark, or even showing pornography, uh, you know, or any kind of verbal or non-verbal conduct. It's not necessarily that you are speaking out something, but even a non-verbal act can constitute sexual harassment. There are, you know, two kinds of sexual, different kinds of sexual harassment which take place. See, it could be, like I said, a verbal, it could be a physical contact, it could also be quit pro quo. Quit pro quo is because of the power of this person in authority. So because being in that authority, uh, they can demand uh, favors um, for promotion, perks, better grade, and forcing this women to, you know, um, uh, comply with it. It could also be between colleagues, and it could also be uh, with the clients, especially where women are in uh, uh, professional um, industries where, you know, um, uh, the women's role is sexually uh, packaged, such as uh, air hostesses, job, women working in beer bars, et cetera. Uh, you know, earlier it was believed that um, uh, prostitutes cannot be sexually harassed, but that is something which is uh, uh, wrong. So even these women have a right to be uh, protected. And it also, uh, you know, a kind of harassment is by, again by women in authority so that it uh, undermines the position of the women. Now, when we are talking in terms of uh, uh, verbal harassment, uh, it could be, you know, asking about a woman's sexual fantasies, preference, asking a lot of sexual, a uh, personal question about her social sexual life, which makes her very uncomfortable. It could also uh, mean uh, uh, making sexual comments about a person's uh, anatomy, clothes, look. And again, you know, asking a person repeatedly to come out, accompany this person, though this person, women may not be interested. It could also include making kissing, howling sounds, or smacking of the lips. And even, um, you know, when you, one is spreading rumors about a person's sex life, uh, that is also uh, regarded as uh, sexual harassment. So, you know, an unwelcome act uh, uh, of physical intimacy can be grabbing, brushing, touching, pinching, patting. Uh, you know, I was part of the sexual harassment committee in my own university. And uh, we got complaints, you know, when a women would go to hand over a file, they would just hold her hand. And many times, you know, women did not uh, like this. So this is something which is very common. You know, like I said right at the beginning, all this happens because it's a power relationship. You know, that woman who is working in the office is not in that kind of a power uh, relationship. It could also, like I said, you know, uh, demand uh, um, sexual favors. It could be uh, because a condition of employment, payment of wages. It could also be a condition for uh, uh, promotion. It could also uh, be showing pornography, pornography to a person uh, through, you know, obscene pictures, cartoons, pinups, calendars. It could also be, you know, any kind of offensive written material or pornographic emails. So, you know, it has really defined sexual harassment in a uh, wide way. Now, many of us think that in uh, public spaces, you know, there cannot be any sexual harassment. But this law also talks about, uh, you know, public spaces where. Uh, uh, sexual relation is not intended. But again, you know, it could lead to a harassment um, uh, in maybe like in roads, in buses, through certain negative um, comments. And it also, you know, uh, when this kind of, uh, um, you know, environment, the whole environment becomes very hostile and anti-women, uh, when, you know, a lot of pornography is shown in public places, foul language is used. So it defines sexual harassment as not just directed against one particular woman. It could be about women in general or creating a uh, discomfort. So you do have a lot of, um, you know, in-depth definition of sexual harassment. 
quid pro quo is you know when you are demanding sexual favors uh, it could be through uh, sexually explicit speech uh, or you know when um, these um, women refuse to comply with a request and then you know they have to um, there is a retaliatory action such as dismissal demotion and the whole working condition is something which becomes very uh, difficult for these women now all of us know that uh, the reason why we are talking about sexual harassment and why it has to be taken very seriously is because overall it creates a very hostile environment for women to work in they will they are certainly not comfortable you know in a place where you have these kinds of pornographic material which is being or where sexist kind of them uh, you know jokes are cracked where there is a lot of physical contact brushing and the whole environment is something which becomes very hostile and women are not um, um, comfortable now what is another you know many a times another impact is when women are not comfortable they would have to quit so they lose their jobs it could you know many have academicians have defined uh, uh, sexual harassment as psychological rape because you know it uh, leads to a lot of nervousness loss of, loss of self esteem and confidence it leads to humiliation guilt feeling and many time like i told you right at the beginning uh, even when we talk of gender violence women think they are the ones who are responsible for this because it's their lot they cannot do anything so in these cases also when continuously these kinds of harassment take place the women think that they are the one who are uh, responsible it also restricts a women's mobility you know women would not like to go in for late night shifts use of public transport becomes um, difficult the whole purpose of this is the victim turns into a wrong doer there is a lot of Uh, slander on her morals and character you know there is a comment by rupan dev bajaj where she says had i known what harassment i would have gone through in filing this case i would have thought twice before filing the case see many time it is the women who is converted um, as being a wrong do and many said what women are taking it so seriously what is after all it's such a small thing you know he just slapped her posterior she is also an equally qualified um, ips officer of the same level just because of her gender that is how you know that's not how men uh, behave with each other so it is how we look at it how we perceive the issue that is very important now you know so there is so much of myth which has been created again the myth you know to try to say that uh, um, you know it is a very um, small thing see but i'm sure all of you remember mulayam singh had one said na londe to londe hi rahenge you know in some when there was a discussion in uh, uh, the parliament see after all these are boys young boys they have to behave like this and so the lot of myth has been created about sexual harassment and say that you know it is something which is very harmless and women who are uh, objecting to it they are women who do not have they lack humor and even today you know we look upon women as eve they are temptress this is something which is um, um, you know um, we go back to the bible the thing only in india we still have the term called eve teasing you know and we take it so much we don't even think about it i still remember you know in an international journal this was in 2003 uh, i had submitted an article and uh, Uh, you know when i got a query and they said she asked me that editor you know she said uh, what do you mean by eve teasing and uh, you know i said my god she is such a senior professor she doesn't understand what is eve teasing so then i kind of explained to her and you know she <laughs> returned back laughing she says rekha couldn't your country find another term for this that really made me think for the first time see how do we look at the bible Eve is someone. She is the one who is the tempter. She is the one who tempted Adam. There was no fault of Adam. So we still Eve teasing is something. It is the women on whom we put the onus, and uh, that is why this harassment takes place. So you know there is so much of a 
Now, myth which is there, but the reality check is something very different. Uh, many say that, uh, you know, after all, sexual harassment is a problem between two individuals. But it's not so. The reality is that it is a pervasive um, public problem and therefore it needs public solutions. Many times it is said that women use sex to go ahead and uh, they often file false claims for sexual harassment. Again, another big myth, like I said in the beginning, prostitutes cannot be sexually harassed, but they are continuously being harassed by police, by middlemen, by their uh, clients. Another big problem is look at the Indian film industry, our whole Bollywood film industry. You know, at least um, uh, I don't, I mean, if you look at the time when we were growing up and we were seeing films, you know, a man would, boys in schools, colleges, they would keep pestering this girl and she would keep saying no, no, no. But it was understood that a no means a yes. And finally, this girl comes in. And it was something, you know, which was projected as something, it's a normal male flirting. It is something which comes very naturally to men. But the reality is, it's not just a normal male flirting. It is an assertion of power. It's an expression of sexuality. Again, you know, a myth is created that women, after all, enjoy sexual harassment. That's what films say. You know, the more a girl is targeted, the more popular she is. But the reality in is Eve teasing is, uh, um, is humiliating or degrading. But this is how the films never portray it. You know, they always look at it. It's Eve teasing. It's the uh, women who are being teased. And another big um, misconception which we have. It's a myth that it is women who ask for it by, you know, wearing revealing clothes or women who are single, women who are divorced, they can easily be harassed. Uh, I'm sure all of you remember there was an exhibition which was organized in New York, if I'm not wrong. What they did, you know, they displayed the clothes worn by women and girls who were raped. And uh, then they said, you know, clothes have nothing to do with rape because the kind of clothes they were wearing was uh, certainly, you know, not which uh, many people think is uh, um, revealing or such. Now, you know, three points which we can discuss based on whatever I have said that, uh, you know, uh, I'll g is it an example, you know, do you think it is sexual harassment when uh, a boss asks, a junior, uh, you know, for certain sexual favors in terms of promotion or other kinds of benefits. And uh, if she is not cooperating, do you think in an office situation that can be called as a sexual harassment? I leave it for you all to uh, discuss. Another example is, you know, when there is a lot of intrusive inquiries into the private life of the employee and, you know, continuously Mm, this woman or girl is being asked out to come out for lunch, dinner, something, you know. Do you think that's sexual harassment? Again, third, you know, when uh, there is a group of people who are joking, sniggering among themselves, uh, do you think um, uh, that's sexual harassment? So, you know, I, in these three kinds of scenarios, we, it is sexual harassment is how you perceive it. See, the whole point of discussing this or having law is, you know, and this is what I keep telling my yes. students also, that we should not be scared. We want a healthy environment. See, if you are very friendly with a group of people, you go out with them, you talk to them, that's not harassment. You are very friendly. So they, how you perceive it. But if the women is uncomfortable, definitely that is sexual harassment. That is how we have to look at it. Now, according to this law, it clearly states out, I have given you some handout also about the law, that it is the duty of the employer to uh, prevent sexual harassment by, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, deterring um, uh, um, the commission of acts of sexual harassment by trying to prevent it. It should also provide a procedure for the resolution of this so that it doesn't um, occur. It also talks about, uh, uh, you know, preventive steps such as um, that organization must put up uh, circulations 
you know, uh, there should be government um, regulation for conduct and discipline, how one should uh, uh, behave. And it also talks about private um, employers, including uh, prohibition in the in, uh, standing orders. It also uh, uh, talks about, you know, in, uh, creation of a uh, appropriate working condition where there is respect for work, leisure, health, so that, you know, there is no hostile um, environment which is created and uh, women are not at a disadvantage in this uh, uh, situation and uh, they are able to connect with their, uh, you know, employ in a healthy setting. It also lays down that certain, uh, you know, uh, proceedings can be uh, started. The employer can initiate appropriate action according to the law when a complaint comes in front of uh, them. It also talks about disciplinary action. What is the kind of disciplinary action that has to be uh, uh, taken? Now, what is very interesting, who are the ones who are protected? It talks about uh, uh, women who draw a regular salary, permanent employers, women who receive an honorarium, and even those who do voluntary work. It is very interesting that the law also covers women who are in the private and unorganized sector. And so, you know, all kinds of uh, women, whether they are permanent, whether they are just receiving an honorarium, or they are in the unorganized sector, uh, they are, uh, uh, you know, part of this law. Now, the law gives you detail about how uh, uh, the complaint mechanism should um, uh, work. It talks about constitution of, uh, you know, when their law is breached or the service rules are uh, breached. It talks about the complaint uh, mechanism. So that, and something very important in this is that it should be time bound. You know, it's not that a complaint is lodged and it can go on endlessly, but there should be a time-bound action which should take place. It also talks about a complaint committee and uh, something, you know, the head of this complaint committee should be a woman and uh, more than half of its members should be uh, women. And it also talks about, uh, you know, if these uh, people are working in an office, um, they may be uh, influenced. It also talks of a third party involvement of an NGO. And uh, so, you know, it uh, gives you a lot of uh, examples. You know, um, uh, the complaint mechanism should, they should there's, it talks about a complaint committee, a special counselor, other kinds of support services. And what is very important is confidentiality should be maintained. The women who's complaining her confidentiality should be maintained. And uh, it also talks about, you know, saying that the employer has to take proper steps and see that, you know, such incidents don't occur. It gives enough protection to the victim, uh, saying that, uh, you know, when there is a complaint one, uh, you know, the victim can, at the end of it, she can either ask her perpetrator's transfer or she can ask for her own transfer if she is uh, uncomfortable. And uh, finally, it also talks about a report that this complaint committee must uh, give a uh, regular annual government and uh, the person, um, uh, you know, should follow these uh, guidelines, uh, etc. And uh, it covers, um, uh, you know, um, various kinds of uh, harassment. And it also talks about these legal measures. I've already mentioned the employer has to set up uh, the complaint committee, have a proper policy. They have to discuss all this policy with their new employers, uh, even see that a third party is involved and uh, try to you know, protect if there is any kind of victimization. Now, it also says that you know, one cannot ignore um, the um, you know the women who is actually harassed is something you know she cannot really ignore that she cannot blame herself she she can talk to others about sexual harassment and how do we you know something very important when if a woman is actually harassed uh, how do we go about it how do we see because you know there is no proof 
a person will not sexually harassed in a public you know um, uh, offenders do that also but generally it happens in private so how do we protect that women there are various you know ways in which um, the women has to be made uh, aware she should talk to others when it is happening this is how we advise many of our students she should maintain a notebook start describe that incident in detail describe that harassment she also has to create a witness for that harassment and without delay she should report it and then after that she can file a formal complaint you know all this is happening in theory i'll give you an example of in reality what is um, happening so you know there are various benefits uh, how much time do i have i think i'm going very slowly hello okay so, you can proceed how much time do i have till 145 minutes till 145 oh, oh still lot of time okay so you know the whole pol um, this policy aims at one to create a safe working environment to improve uh, interpersonal relations to have a higher work uh, uh, performance and productivity less uh, abstinence from in the part of the women and even retain women as valued empro employees increase the profitability and even you know enhance the public image of that uh, institution or company and it is a better practice to uh, follow now you know this is something when sexual harassment is something which is you know referring to government officers institutions companies private public but then you know if the employer and employee you know that relationship is not there for example um, you know in a university or a college or a school situation it's it's not just the employer employee you have lot of students how do we deal with them these are also covered and uh, you have even professional bodies like indian medical association bar association uh, where uh, it is covered they may not be covered under the vishakha judgment but then ugc is for these institution it has made a mo model sexual harassment policy which has to be uh, followed and it talks about punishment also appropriate action has to be taken the offenders conduct can be punishable under the indian penal code and the employer must register the complaint and like i said the victim could choose between the perpetrators transfer or their own there was you know i'll just quickly go to two three um, studies which i have seen and uh, uh, one you know there is very little data on this issue the first survey in 2002 was conducted between march 22nd and 25th and this was published in the uh, magazine news magazine the week it was conducted in delhi mumbai chennai and bangalore and it was very interesting that 43% of the people who were surveyed by this uh, uh, for this data uh, they were in the age group of 29 to 30 and 75% of them were married we generally think no sexual harassment would not take place for married women but then the survey in 2002 showed that uh, more than 70 i mean 75% of the women who were harassed were uh, married you know, and so Uh, i'm using it primarily from that week uh, report it talks about um, uh, you know many women said no harassment takes place a, a, a large number of women did not say that they didn't want to uh, refer to it so it is you know you can see the numbers people women did not even want to talk about it then you know when they were asked whether their office has a clear policy uh, many said that uh, Uh, no it does not have a clear policy and they don't know about it then you know they were asked why is it that women do not complain and uh, then you know that um, the maximum women said that it would lead to social bycott and this is something which we have also seen when women complain it's not that easy you know it leads to lot of uh, other kinds of uh, uh, issues and then you know why is it that a women complain when this was asked and finally you know many maximum women said that when it leads to a physical contact you know they don't mind words they don't mind you know all these kinds of comments others but when it physical contact happens then they uh, want to complain 
and uh, second you know when there is a demand for sexual favors and otherwise you know they kind of just ignore it they don't take it uh, very seriously and when it was asked you know you know are men falsely accused and uh, you know many said no they said no it's there is some reality in the case which is going on now you know i'll just give you an example of um, our own university like i said you know when we started the sexual harassment committee i was a member of that um, uh, committee and you know i just discussed three cases that came in front of us and it will give you an idea about how this issue is so complicated you know there are so many issues that come into it it's not just uh, you know a person is harassing a, uh, another person but it leads to a lot of things so initially what happened when we this committee was established based on the visakha uh, guidelines and ugc had also mentioned it we were also learning we were just kind of beginning and um, when we started the committee there was no ngo representation in it then we realized that you need a third uh, um, person when this you know first time when this committee see today it's an accepted thing but when this committee was formed you know many of our own colleagues our own male colleagues they said what is all this you all bring in too much feminist things and all that do you think uh, uh, you know we have these kinds of issues in our university why do you want to make a big issue out of it you know at that time see now it has been recognized that this is something which is by law and you need to have this committee i'm talking about the initial stages and we had put up a lot of posters throughout the university and they looked upon it as oh these feminist whims they are the ones you know this is something which uh, is not needed i'm just talking about three cases which we dealt with see now holi is uh, a big celebration in north india and in kerala you don't have so much holi we get all students from all over india and the first complaint which we had to deal with the case we had to deal with in the computer science department you know it's not that easy to get admission into our university you have um, you know more than 40 50 000 students who write um, an exam and only 50 60 students are selected so um, these uh, boys and computer science uh, is a well established recognized um department so at that time what happened there were about 20 25 boys who had come from north india and said and what we realized during this case that all these boys went and they uh, you know played holi with these girls and the girls felt that they had misbehaved with them now what when the girls who filed a complaint were all from kerala and uh, you know they were very upset and now you know when we called these boys they were in for a shock and they said but after all it was holy what did we do we just rubbed color on them and you know they caught hold of them and all that so it made us realize you know that we had to tell them that no this is a behavior which is not acceptable here but to them you know it was after all a holy and they don't behave like this every time it's only on holy that they behave like this so you know so much of a regional difference came in that is something which hit us very clearly again you know uh, another incident where a lot of you know one or two girls this girl was getting a lot of pornographic mail now she easily identified based on you know she was an odia girl and she identified that this is uh, uh, an odia boy who sending her this mail and she went made a complaint again we realized that it was such a regional issue when all these girls come in see most of the girls who are in the university are more urban based and uh, many of the boys who get admission are from very rural areas and all that and first time you know when they see a lot of these girls they think they are very free now this you know lot of issues that came up that they these boys think that they own since all these girls are odia girls the odia boy thinks that they have a control and they will you know when they see this girl wearing jeans or some kind of a dress they will say why do you dress up like this why do you you know and this girl said look i have always stayed in urban areas and i have uh, this is how i always dress up but you know many of the boys felt that you know she is bringing a bad name to oriya culture so you know it became a big 
you know, one, a regional issue, and then um, um, an urban and a rural issue. But the most difficult case which we had to deal with was of a supervisor, you know, a very senior professor, very well known and, you know, harassing his research students. For three, four years, this girl was in the fourth year, she did not make a complaint because she knew he was a very well recognized professor and he would, uh, you know, he could ruin her career, he would spoil her career. But then, you know, finally, when she was not able to deal with it, she made this complaint. She would keep pestering her when there is a conference, you know, he would ask her to come. So she says, I had no, she would accompany him. And then he would insist that she stay in the same room with him. And she says with great difficulty, uh, you know, she would escape or uh, somehow make excuses. He would keep uh, um, asking her to accompany. When he wanted to discuss her chapters, he would tell her to come at evening 6.37 uh, in, in the department. So she would bring a friend, the friend would sit outside. And uh, it, you know, really brought us, uh, the professor was a Telugu professor, this girl was again an Oriya girl. And when this case was being discussed, it became a big Oriya versus a Telugu issue. Nobody was looking at it in terms of our relationship. When we finally called this professor and, you know, he came to the, after two, two times, he didn't come to the committee, but finally third time when he came. And, you know, she just started bombarding this girl with questions. One after the other. One after, this girl was suddenly so shocked and stunned. She could not answer anything. And then he look. Was nothing. She is not doing work, and that's the reason she filed this complaint. She is not up to the mark. So you know, he again showed a lot of power. So it's, it's a very power game. Again, I want to talk about another case. You know, the government of India when they started these uh, sexual um, harassment, uh, you know, when the laws on the money of the committees were formed. So um, there was a big project by the National Institute of Public Cooperation and Department of Women and Child Welfare. So um, they, um, you know, three states were uh, taken up, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu. I did the study for uh, Andhra Pradesh. And, um, you know, our whole study was we had to, you know, look at how these complaint committees were working, what was the mechanism to study sexual harassment, how did the reporting system work? We were we had to look at government, NGOs, and see how they were dealing with these uh, issues. And then we had to make certain recommendations to the government, and uh, you know which would benefit all. Now our target group for this study was both uh, public and private sector undertakings. And uh, finally, out of a sample size of uh, we had 20 institutions where we um, had 20 heads of the department, 38 committee members, and 106 male employees, and 108 uh, female employees. So, you know, it was uh, for the you know, Andhra before it got divided. That's when we did our study. Now, you know, it was not that easy to do the study. It was so difficult that uh, initially, you know, in Andhra, I'm talking about only Andhra because that's where I did my study. And uh, what we did is we looked at three districts. We said uh, crime rate against women is uh, more here. So we decided we'll do it in Mahbub Nagar, Karim Nagar, and Islamabad, these three. And we said we'll do it. But it was so difficult when we went there, nothing like a sexual harassment committee existed. And finally, you know, after spending about two, three months not getting any results, we had to leave uh, Mahbub Nagar, Karim Nagar, and Islamabad, and we said we will only limit our study to Hyderabad state, and we'll do it in Hyderabad. And what we found is, you know, in Hyderabad state also, it was not that easy. When we went to, you know, we had, uh, because there was nothing like a sexual harassment committee which really functions, except in few one or two places. And we had the same kind of experience with IT companies, you know, the HR department welcomed us, we were given tea, coffees and all that. They gave us their policy, they discussed how good they are, they don't have any 
uh, issues of sexual harassment. But then when we wanted to talk to their employees and all, it was very difficult. We could just not talk to anyone. By the, when we finished, uh, we had sent a letter to the transport department. They kept, you know, so many times we went, they said, okay, come tomorrow. It is with this head, with that head. And finally, we finished our report, but we didn't get any reply from the transport department. Now, I'll quickly sum up, you know, the heads. We had, uh, you know, it was very difficult to meet the heads. They were familiar with the sexual harassment policy. They knew about it. But then, uh, you know, since nothing like a committee exists, there was nothing that they could tell us. And... Uh, one very common response which we got in many government offices. He said, Madam, please come and have a look at our women. See, all of them wear saris. They all have long hair and you know they will not be harassed. Go to IT companies. You will find a lot of sexual harassment cases over there. So you know that was the very common response which we got. The committee members also whom we interviewed, half of them didn't know what was happening. See, the whole approach of the institution was that when a sexual harassment case will come, then we'll form a committee and then we'll come to um, certain conclusions. Since there is no case, why should we have a committee? You know, that was the kind of approach. See, the study was done initially around 2005 or 10. I don't know. Uh, recently, things have changed. I just cannot say. But that is what we uh, found. And there was, you know, nothing which the committee members could also tell us. What we found ultimately that you know, it is such a narrow mindset which works. And, you know, you were linking sexual harassment. Nobody understood it as a power relationship. You were either linking it to the dress, the behavior. Uh, sometimes we got very, you know, we got very enthusiastic response to general questions. You know, when we asked them, do you know what sexual harassment is? They gave us good definition. They were very clear. Why women get harassed? We got very good answers. Why is it that women do not complain? We got very good answers. But then, when we said, is there any such case? Have you come across any such case in your organization? That is where we hit the wall and there was no answer. And, uh, you know, we could not get any response. So, again, you know, I would uh, like to uh, end, like, um, you know, we have to be very clear. Sexual harassment is something, you know, uh, you have to really break that cycle. There are various strategies which have to be followed. Like I said in the beginning, one has to keep a notebook when that behavior happens. Because see, what is very important in many cases is we do not have proof. How do you prove it? So this woman who is harassed has to make a note. She has to send them either the policy of the uh, office. And she should, again, you know, if some, somebody is making that kind of a remark, she should ask them. Uh, you know, I, I did not understand. Can you please repeat it? So, you know, you have to really create that uh, um, this evidence. And we keep saying that you cannot ignore sexual harassment. You know, many women think that if they ignore it, it will go away. But this is often interpreted as a sign of approval. One has to really make an effort, you know, when sexist remarks are being passed, jokes are being uh, passed, you know you have to really make an effort to make those groups understand that this is a behavior which cannot be accepted and it would come under sexual harassment. One has to create witness, uh, either send them the policy, send them the institution brochures, uh, the behavior, and then finally form a company. Before I end, you know, all of you are familiar, let me talk a little about the Me Too movement. It is very recent, which has come up now. And, uh, uh, you know, it's an offshoot of the American movement. 2018 only we saw this uh, Me Too movement. And all of you know very well, I don't have to report uh, it, but this actress, Tanushri Datta, you know, she um, was uh, the heroine in this film, On OK Please, which was being made in 2008. And Nana Patekar had, um, you know, he was trying to grab her and, uh, she ran out, you know, but her car was mobbed, her screen was uh, smashed, and she went and made a formal complaint, but nothing happened. And finally, she left the movie industry and migrated to the States. And it was in 2008, after eight, 2008, this incident occurred. In 2018, she uh, made this complaint. 
now what happened you know it just began as a story of an individual women but soon it became uh, a phenomena so many names started surfacing see this is a reality we put it brush it under the carpet and we think it doesn't touch us but this is a reality of our society you know and so many names came up at that time alok nath sajid khan mj akbar the journalist and it brought out you know so many of these individual stories and uh, you know they started this whole social media because by now we had the social media that became a very powerful weapon in the hands of these women and uh, the advantage it had it, it united these survivors it dispelled the fear of speaking and listening to other stories gave them a lot of uh, strength and courage to come out so it was a multi layered uh, phenomena you know they were trying to speak truth to power that this is a reality people in power how they behave it was naming and shaming those people it was also a catharsis for what they were going through you know women suppressed these for 10 years 15 years 20 years and it was also a protest against privilege in some cases now finally you know it uh, um, there are different you know they either wanted uh, uh, to provide impunity to the wrongdoers they try to you know uh, uh, predatory behavior which was routinized was something which was uh, uh, looked down upon and uh, many women who succeeded you know the process also kind of uh, bone them up it's not that easy there's a lot of criticism of this movement to many this was a very elitist movement it said it did not go beyond uh, naming and shaming but then we have to understand you know many said why did it take so long for these women 18 19 years it's not that easy the moment you are harass your women just does not walk up and go and report it you know these women had um, had to deal with it for so many years but definitely it uh, created awareness um, about the rights of the women as individuals in the workplace and outside and we did see a lot of impact though you know uh cases were filed but nothing came out of it but definitely many accused were fired they had to either resign they were condemned and disassociated from membership of their respective bodies or um, industry and it did bring in a lot of indignation um uh, um at large you know their uh, fans at large were critical of them because many of them were very powerful actors now immediately after this the government of india set up a committee of a group of ministers under union home minister rashan singh who was the road and transport minister mr kari nirmala sita raman and menka gandhi and they were again looking into the you know making a safe environment for women they also launched an electronic complaint box so that uh, it would enable the light bring to light any complaint that was lost so therefore you know i will now conclude my presentation and uh, definitely you know, sexual harassment is something which has to be uh, taken very seriously with now more and more women coming into the public space all of them working in the uh, public uh, environment this is an issue which can no longer be brushed under the carpet we have to take it and the major problem which one encounters is the lack of data you know many women don't speak it's very difficult unless you know recently we've had the me too movement but it has like i said so many of its critics and many times even women who are harassed do not go and report because they fear losing their job you know many of the women who made complaints were out of the film industry and uh, you know they feared that their names would be maligned and uh, uh, they felt that they would be blamed for whatever happened and the men in question would go scot free because they are so powerful and uh, again uh, you know it is the victim who gets turned into uh, the wrong doer and uh, there is uh, a lot of you know acceptance but we have to say that uh, sexual harassment is something which is unacceptable at the workplace and for a 
creation of a safe workplace, a healthy and working environment where women are also comfortable. We have to create a better workspace. And only then, you know, when there are healthy relationships, will it, uh, we have a working and healthy environment. Thank you. Yes. I would like to suggest a 10 minute break so that after that we can take questions. Okay. So we can have a 10 minute break and then we can take the questions. Okay. Fine. Okay then. Okay. Bye. Hello. Uh, yeah. Okay, one minute. Okay.
ओके हेलो या वन मिनट वन Yes. Madam, ma'am, there, is there is one question in chat box, ma'am. You please check the chat box and one or two questions are posed in chat box, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Well, I read out one or two two questions, but where does appeal lie against the decision of ICC? This was raised by Nitish Kumar. Would you like to respond? Yeah. One minute. What is it? Two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. There are three to four questions, madam. One is uh, with regard to ICC. Where does appeal lie against the decision of ICC? That is one question. Hmm. And. There are some more questions. We will take the questions one by one. So, first question is this: See, well, the appellate uh, mechanisms are uh, different for different organizations, but generally, you know, it is through the court. So, I am really not clear in this what has happened and uh, how it is coming up. So, I will really not be able to shed light on this. But it is finally, you know, what happened like in. Uh, initially there is a generally this is how it works there is a sexual harassment committee which is there it finds out uh, the details but it has it does not have the power of law so finally it is a court which will have to take a decision and this happened in many of the cases with which we were dealing the sexual harassment committee which is formed by an institution does not have that power so and you know again um, it goes to the court but what was good in many of the cases which we dealt with the court does not go into detail you know the victim is uh, who is made a complaint is called but uh, uh, you know it looks at the proceedings of the committee and takes a decision based on that so i'm sure it, the same thing would be followed in this case also yes anything else There is one more question from Vipin Singh, madam. It says, "Can gender-based discrimination at workplace, without any explicit sexual or tones, be covered hmm. under the Sexual Harassment Act?" This is the question. No, gender discrimination, um, unless it is leading to some, you know, it cannot, it's not come coming under this unless you know it makes the women uncomfortable through a sexually loaded kind of uh, remark. see gender discrimination in general many of the countries are uh, uh, following it what they do is uh, uh, you know they are since it uh, does not create a healthy environment it does not give equal opportunities to women they have also included it it varies in different countries in different ways okay yeah okay i have uh, i have another question Uh, will it apply to students at professional colleges? I have seen some complaints of harassment by staff of such colleges. Girls are under pressure because of internal marks. See, this is definitely you know this is something which is uh, uh, used um, has to apply to everyone. Again, like I said, we have to understand sexual harassment as a power. It's a relationship between power and um, you know. in a university set up in a professional college you know, or any other um, uh, institution since the person has the power to allot marks to you know decide on internals uh, it is very difficult but yes the mechanism exists see if it is only you know in these cases where we have found out if many girls come together and make a complaint 
then obviously that person has that kind of a behavior and it has to be taken very seriously so yes many girls do not uh, complain but it's a fact it occurs but it can be made um, and it is covered under the sexual harassment act okay there is one more question from vishal madam what are the inbuilt mechanisms in this act to practically cover the misuse of this act misuse in the sense um, i don't think it has um, any such these kinds of inbuilt mechanism uh, which is saying you know that uh, it defines that when a complaint can be launched and uh, you know when we say misuse or something you know this is something it is understood that no women would just go and complain see after all when the sittings take place the men who are accused will always say there is no truth in this you know but then uh, when the women start speaking when they talk i think it makes a lot of impact but yes you know sometimes it is misused and it depends on the judgment of the committee as to what decision it will take Okay. And Nitish Kumar wants to know who audits the implementation of this act in different government organizations. Who is the auditor of this uh, implementation of this? It is, it is um, uh, you know, like I said, the act itself provides that every year that institution has to send a report to the government of India, saying that you know these were the cases which came up. This is how it dealt with. and uh, um, but many a uh, times they don't send these reports it is generally the institution itself which has to monitor it see it is not something we have to understand that sexual harassment is not something which is a kind of a top down yes uh, there is a law which has come but then it is in the interest of the institution organization to implement this so that there is a better working condition and a healthy environment so um, it is something you know the institution itself will have to implement it there is no outside body which is there fine and ankit singh wants to know are we not simplifying sexual harassment when we relate it only to sex isn't it more related to abuse of power and showing aggression and manipulation no but then how how do how else it's what you are saying is correct but then it's um, not uh, that we are simplifying it with this question i think that it's a very interesting question has he written it down or he is orally asking it so it is the question is posted in the chat box okay are we not simplifying the question has been when we relate to the after most of it why is this woman getting harassed it's only because of her sex no i i'm sure you remember that film as it is not that only women get harassed sometimes men can also be harassed that whole film uh, no i think akshay kumar and uh, priyanka chopra it shows that uh, uh, a man is being harassed and he files a complaint so yes you know but by and large it is only women who can be harassed you know one or two exceptions may be there but by and large it is only women who are harassed and why they are harassed because they belong to a particular sex and that sex is not seen as being powerful in comparison to women so definitely i don't think we are simplifying the issue that's the reality of the issue and because of this men show power they show aggression there is manipulation so you know it's not it's i don't think we're simplifying it sex is at the you know it's the undercurrent of the whole issue then it says women can also be harassed in sadhu women men is it covered like i said yes sometimes you know when women in, a, in an office situation etc but by and large you know as social scientists or even when law takes place, you know by and large it is the reality in society so the reality is a man can also be harassed but the reality is because of our relationship it is more women who will be harassed. So by and large, it covers women. Women cannot do that. Anything else? Yeah, what is our post? I think that again, yes, gender neutral. I have answered that. Yeah. Okay. Do you notice any more questions? 
वन मिनट आई एम जस्ट लिख The title of this itself is Sexual Harassment of Women at the Workplace. Yes. Anything else? See, recently I published a book in which I have an article. Unfortunately, I couldn't scan it, so I wanted to send it. I've looked at this whole issue of sexual harassment and the Me Too movement. so maybe once this uh, lockdown is open i'll try to scan it and send it okay but i would like to throw some any uh, other question i would like to throw some light on sexual harassment in uh, Mahabharata and the other. Since we are also interested in history and all. Oh, no, no. See, this is something which is there right from the beginning. But like I said, we have invented a name now. Harassment is something we have always throughout. You know, if you remember in Mahabharata, uh, the women in Mahabharata are much more stronger than women in the Ramayana. when draupadi was sent to the court you know she questions the two elders who are sitting she asked a question and she said did you they still give him sir first or give me first then that person he says you first you they still bid himself then she said when you they still lost his freedom he was no longer an independent person and i am a free woman when he is a slave what right does a slave have over me a free woman how can he Put me as a bed. She argues, you know, with all them openly. And again, you know, a very interesting case in Surpana. When Surpana is her nose is cut, her ear is cut. She goes running to her brother Ravan. First, she goes to her brother Karan. So she, because she is harassed, you know, and then she goes to Ravan saying, "You must take revenge." But when Sita becomes pregnant. You know Ram when a woman says he just leaves her in the jungle. He goes, you know, to the ashram of um, and stays over there. She cannot go back to her brother or her father. So you know, uh, the more developed society is, we kind of accept the subordination of women. But a society which is still at a developing stage, they are they have much more freedom in that sense. In fact, you can epic drama and rival sides of the race for our nation. See, there are very interesting. You know, look at it. You look at some of the folk versions of the drama. You know, they are very dynamic. This is a totally different kind of uh, picture. So that what I'm saying is, it's always there. We may give it any name, but because of this power relationship, there is a lot of harassment in place. Only now we are giving it a name. There is a law to protect it. That's all. Any other questions? I would like to throw some light on COVID impact, madam. When uh, uh, you are right, I think the mic is making. I would like to throw some light on. Uh, Do any comment on gender dis discrimination caused by this lockdown because of COVID outbreak? <laughs> see, lot of women are complaining. You no, know, you look at WhatsApp and all that. You know, because see, men are staying at home. Many women, men do not share in housework and also it, women are also working from home in IT companies and all. And yet they are doing all the household work, everything because servants and all are not able to come and all. So uh, that's what I can see very obviously. very little sharing of work takes place so that is something which has uh, really impacted unlike uh, and um, there are lot of um, you know especially abroad and all we said it has also increased uh, domestic violence yes 
you know, in that situation, there are lots of writings, you know, if you look at it now, it leads to a lot of psychological, uh, if, you know, men are not going out, they are many a times, they're not able to drink. Or, so it is, domestic violence is something which is increasing. There were reports even in Kerala we could hear. So it's very difficult now, you know, but these are some broad trends which we are seeing. And uh, one, you know, there is an increase in the work for women. And uh, in India, at least, you have so much of help, domestic help and other things. When that is not coming, so it has um, increased women's burden and it has definitely led to an increase in domestic uh, violence. That is something which is reported. Another very interesting thing in Europe and all, when I was saying, you know, when these two football clubs play and any team which loses its match, you know, they, they go home and there's a lot of violence against women. They bring out all their anger against uh, women. So many of my friends uh, abroad tell me that, uh, you know, the moment there is a big match and these, uh, they lose, uh, it increases uh, violence against women. So those kinds of things which we are seeing now also, it is there. One more comment from Pankaj Garg, madam. Is there a rise in domestic violence? Of course. Ah, yeah. This is what I was answering. No, yes, it is. Yeah. It leads to a lot of you know, violence. I think, no, there are a lot of things, especially when you are confined to a place. Initially, it looks, you know, psychological, it has a lot of impact. And, uh, you know, when that workspace is um, uh, limited, there is not much space to move about. See, I think we will be seeing the impact uh, after some time, you know, what impact. See, one, definitely the economies have all gone down and that will have a lot of impact on the economy. But in terms of gender relations also, it is going to have a lot of impact. You know, I'm part of a group which has just started all over the world. And uh, they are, you know, now it, it started as an email group. And they are trying to assess the impact which this coronavirus is having on gender relations. And, uh, you know, you have people from all across the world, many feminists are part of that, and they are sharing a lot of their experiences. So we don't know, maybe at the end of it, we'll come to know. Now it's at the beginning stage, you know, it's very difficult to even make any such comments. But yes, we've had a lot of experiences earlier. It was very, you know, like uh, when I talked to friends in Tirupati and all, you have so much of prostitution and trafficking in Tirupati, which I found it very difficult. And uh, they said, uh, no, you know, they, it, there is a lot of increase over there because then they think after that they go visit the uh, God and they think they are absolved of everything. So you don't know how the psyche works, you know. So all these would lead to a lot of negative forces and it can increase domestic violence. One more comment, madam. The advanced uh, oldest democracy in the world, America, so far could not elect a woman as its president. Whereas young <laughs> democracy like India could elect a woman as a prime minister and president. What is your take on this? No, definitely. See, we somehow think, you know, that um, uh, the more advanced country, the better the uh, relations are there. No, there, these are issues which are equally serious in those countries also. And again, having said that, just because you have a president or a prime minister uh, doesn't mean that it brings in better gender relations here. But yes, it is, it is definitely one step ahead in terms of empowerment. We have still not seen it in America. I don't know when they are going to uh, elect. So these are again realities. You know, openly everyone would not say that. But then there are a lot of undercurrents which go. If you remember, see, look at the whole reservation bill. In the 73rd and 74th Amendment, we gave, you know, very happily we gave women, um, you know, representation. But then in the parliament, that bill is stuck for more than 14, 15 years. The kind of debates that took place, you know, all these women will come, they will rule. In the Panchayati Raj, we were able to give them because the panchayats are only an implementing body. They are not a decision-making body. But in the parliament, if you have this reservation bill, women will be able to, you know, decide on policies. 
So there were so many, you have seen for the last 15 years, we are seeing those of us who are interested. Sometimes they say, no, we need reservation in this. Then the women said, no, it should be irrespective of reservation. Uh, we want that, you know, women representation should be there. The kinds of debate that we're going, which is the kind of people, women who will come to the parliament and all that. So it is, um, you know, something which is there. See, it is all over the world. It is a patriarchal society. That is the underlying crux of the whole situation. Definitely, yeah, in a patriarchal uh, society, relations are different. And an that is what... Pankaj Garg, hmm? uh, one interesting question from Pankaj Garg. Hmm. Uh, will coronavirus issue give boost to cultural work from home and may reduce incidence of sexual harassment or will it also provide more opportunity to women who could not work due to family issues? It's an interesting observation. Yeah. See, like I said, it's too early to say that. Definitely, this culture from work can succeed if men are also sharing, no? Like I gave you an example, it's not that, you know, women who have to work and plus manage the whole house by themselves. Then it is certainly not empowerment, no? Women who will get better opportunities to work if, um, uh, you know, there is a sharing of this work, then it gives them some free time. But today, you know, women have changed. They are going out, they are working, but men have not changed. How many men are really involved in these kinds of, you know, household things, other issues. So, I mean, it's too early to say that, but maybe we'll uh, <laughs> see the conclusions once things are a little more clear. Madam, what about self-reference in India? Because sales six ratio, according to 2011 census, was around 914. So, how do we go on this issue? See, again, uh, like I keep telling, you know, it's, see, we are fighting a bias which is more than 3,500 years old. It's not going to go away so easily. As a historian, let me tell you, in the Athar Ved, you know, when the wife becomes pregnant, the husband and wife go and pray to the sun god, and they say, oh god, grant us a son here and a daughter elsewhere. There are so many Brat, pujas, etc., to have sons. Look at all our religious texts. You know, everyone either importance is given to 100 sons, 50 sons, 60 sons. May you be the mother of 100 sons. So, that whole ideology of giving so much importance, why are we giving importance to that ideology? Because according to Hindu tradition, we, we come to this earth to pay three of our debts. One is to our ancestors, one is to our guru. And one is, you know, to carry on the family tradition. See, we can, uh, through following various vrat niyams, we can, you know, pay our debt to our ancestors. And a son is called Poot. A Poot is somebody who saves you from hell. If you do not have a son, you will not be saved from hell. So, uh, having a son, a man can pay, put his debts to the son and then go away, you know, pass away peacefully. So having a son is so important according to our religious text and tradition. Women do not have that kind of right. A father cannot put the burden on his daughter. So there was always a preference for a son. And this is something which is true not only in India or our Eastern tradition, even in many Western traditions. If you look at, you know, as a historian, I can tell you that when civilization started, initially we had, uh, you know, matriarchy was given importance. Mother goddesses are worshipped. Look at Bhimbetika cave, look at others. You have a lot of these figures of women who are there. Women are worshipped. And uh, mother goddess is something which all earlier civilization worshipped. And because, you know, when... At that time, they didn't understand science. They did not understand the role of men in procreation. They could see the women getting pregnant. If a woman did not care, take care of the child, the child would die. Because unlike animal, we didn't have hair or something. It was the women who would feed that child and protect that child. 
so the women almost had that god like power of creating a human being so you have lot of worship of uh, uh, mother goddesses in early civilization but then when the archaic states came gerda learner i'm speaking from gerda learner has written a very interesting book called creation of patriarchy how patriarchy is created and she talks about when these archaic states come into being archaic states are you know when you have the roman civilization greek civilization mesopotamian civilization egyptian civilization these are civilizations where one there is a small group of property class who own all the resources they control everything they are also military rulers they have all the property with them they become the aristocrats and then you know they want to see that this property passes on to their next generation engels gives a very you know he he calls it this was the biggest day of mother's defeat you know when you want to see when private property emerges you want to see that this property passes on to your uh, only to your son how do you prove who is the father of the child there is enough proof to show who is the mother of the child but how do you prove who is the father of the child so in order to see that the child to whom this property is given is only your child you had to first see that the freedom of women is curtailed and it is at this point in time where you have all these notions of respectability non respectability a respectable woman is one who belongs to one man and you know uh, a non respectable woman is who does not belong to any one man and you have you know the prostitute the vaishya the um, courtesan though they are earning their own living but they are not respectable because they do not belong to one particular man so this is how slowly if you look at it historically this whole process of domination and uh, uh, you know subordination comes into being so there is a big historical uh, reality behind it and it is from that time it's very interesting that we have had so many you know all these thousands of years civilization has developed we have had so many different kinds of modes of production we started with this primitive civilization then we had slave mode of production then you had feudal mode of production capitalist mode of production socialist mode of production and uh, but patriarchy is something which continues and patriarchy gets strengthened more and more uh, in the whole uh, um, process because you know women also it's not that you know the whole world is divided into men on one and women on the other and all men are against the women and all women are against the men you know gender is a very complicated issue we have to really understand it and when you know triple talaq or you know maintenance bill etc is come it's the women who go in front and say that we don't want it because women's identity belonging to that culture to that community becomes much more important than their uh, you know getting these rights as women see gender is in history it's so easy to go in uh, you know create a revolution to fight you can go and burn someone else's um, lands you can go and burn someone else's factories go and burn someone else's buses but the moment you talk of gender you talk of you know a revolution a change whom are you fighting your own husband your own brother your own uncles and you yourself are tied in all those relationships so it's a very complicated thing we have to really understand that and you know patriarchy has not changed throughout this period it gets more and more strengthened by different phases of changes which take place in society but uh, you know we just had this matriarchal um, societies in the beginning and then by the time the greeks etc came you have um, patriarchal society under greek law the uh, women were not allowed to go out they had to stay inside in quarters these were uh, you know don't look at films like ben hur etc which give you a totally you know hollywood version of it but in sparta there is something called a mother's ration if the mother gave birth to a son she would get double the quantity of wine corn and rye for her you know for her upkeep but if she gave birth to a daughter it was reduced to half sparta which had such a uh, tradition of these sports women 
there also you know girls were treated very badly under roman law a man had a total right free no he could not be questioned by any law if he beat his wife and killed her or beat his child and killed them women never got a equal status under roman civilization they were always treated as you know being dependent on men they were inferior to men under feudalism again you know when church takes over you know it starts feudalism starts with the hierarchy where military organizations are important where there is a you know land becomes very important for having power and all this is under the control of the men and slowly what happened this whole division of respectable women non respectable women women are excluded from other areas they are not allowed to only a prostitute courtesan or even devdasi for that matter they are allowed to read write be good in music etc for the respectable women her only she has to be totally dependent on her husband she has to um, you know take care of his family see that the children that she bears belongs to this person so there is a curtailment of the rights of women at that time and this is happening throughout the world not necessarily in india one more issue madam telangana has a best practice of reserving 33% of jobs to women hmm is it worth emulating by other states for creating equal opportunities for women different states are following different things uh, you know uh, but unfortunately hmm. what is happening in yes in some states they have got rights they are you know with this reservation some women have uh, benefited in other states you know it's not followed uh, uniformly everywhere but yes it does uh, give uh, certain uh, you know rights i was traveling in um, up and i was so impressed i took a picture you know all the taxis had this big alarm which were connected to the police station they told me it was only in two places i think in uh, dehradun and uh, halwani region that if a passenger sitting and uh, the driver cannot even Uh, turn and press that she could if there is anything she could press this girl could press that and the police station the alarm would ring because all these were uh, registered and um, they had to you know no taxi is allowed without uh, this registration or that uh, buzzer being uh, put on that taxi you know for the safety of women the different states are trying out different ways we still don't have that in hyderabad i was very impressed with that so yes it varies from different states etc but unless we talk in terms of parity and you know bring in that kind of we are losing out a lot see we have to understand violence is something not just a man beating his wife but violence has a lot of connotation it has a political impact it has an economic impact it has a social impact political impact you know in the sense that in, in a society where women continue to be beaten Uh, what would uh, um, you know, the, what empowerment are we talking about how can women take decisions they will not be empowered it involves lot of economic costs you know because if you are going to hospital in terms of medicine if you want to break that marriage in terms of legal cost etc and social cost you know it sends a very wrong message to the family that you know just because you are in power you can just beat a woman and get whatever you want so the children also learn the same the son also sees that behavior and he continues that same uh, behavior so you know we have to talk about violence as not just beating a women but one which has a lot of economic cause which has a social cause which has an uh, political cause and only then you know we'll be able to really understand violence in its true sense So we'll we'll now end by uh, final question, madam. You have written a book on Devadasis in South India. Yeah, most yeah. Of the, uh, most of the most of the OTs are from North India. Would you like to throw some light on your contribution? We will end by this question. Okay. <laughs> See, I became I have looked at lot of these records. I'm uh, in history also. I do lot of work on women's history, and um, you know when I started as a young uh, researcher, I said history is all about men. There's nothing about women in that. you know because history is only something which happens in the public domain it is war diplomacy and women are just silent spectators so i became very interested in these questions and i was uh, started looking into it and now i am um, you know when i looked at these devdasis 
these are women who are married to god and they are treated as uh, you know um, the king also participates in the uh, wedding ceremony etc and they are sexually exploited by the king or by the others look at the whole visa system comfort women all over the world we have these so this was something which attracted my attention we do not have much evidence of um, devdasis in north india though one of my students did her thesis she looked at you know uttarakhand region and there is a uh, she gave some examples of you know women being made devdasis over there unfortunately not many people have studied this but in the south yes from 10th century i have come across a lot of records i have collected a lot of records in my book where you know these are very powerful women they have lot of land they are wealthy women they are rich women and um, they are totally in control but then by 18th century what happens when the britishers come earlier they had lot of patronage from the temples and uh, they survived on this but then when the british come they bring in contingency act etc these women are uh, treat they translate it as a prostitute and many of these women lose their patronage and they go into prostitution and at that time you know the difference between a courtesan and devdasi gets totally uh, blurred and um, so you know throughout history we have maintained this division between uh, women who are respectable because they belong to the patriarchal order they belong to one man and women who are not respectable and they do not though they are very rich wealthy women they are very uh, powerful women so and this led me to you know i now work a lot on i brought out a book on trafficking of women sexual trafficking of women and uh, looking at devdasis i became interested in the question of trafficking of women uh, present day and again you know it's all par relationship finally it just boils down to one patriarchal uh, uh, structure and par relationship i think we can end with that point fortunately there is one more comment madam would you like to yeah take what is it I moti think... wants to know are there any states uh, or societies which are still following this devdasi system yeah but you know please go to youtube video go to youtube you will find 1001 films on that in um, uh, the national commission of women in 1995 it uh, sent a letter to all the different states in the country saying that please give us uh, the report of number of devdasis you have and uh, you know you have that report is available online and uh, today also it continues karnataka has the maximum number maharashtra also has now you know a lot of work was done in andhra by hemlata lamnam and others you know they um, established lot of these chelli nilayams they trained the children of these devdasis and uh, it has vanished from andhra pradesh you had something every in every region it has a different form in andhra it is called the jobin system somewhere they are called murlis different names are uh, given to them so uh, it still exists look at karnataka and all you know today also there is a big festival where they all participate and all many of the women who are in prostitution come from this system you know it has a different folk variation many of the jogins in andhra pradesh have done some work i recently published an article on the jogins in a, a journal from pakistan where um, uh, you know the they become the keep of the village headman and their house were designed in such a way that there is no front door the, at night he would come in and then go back and it was very interesting you know when there was a girl i've given her case study in my book she has two children by this dorra by the landlord and yet she uh, you know he will not uh, drink water touch with her hand so they follow caste system in other thing but when it comes to uh, sexual relation there is no caste system so you know it's, but now luckily all this in andhra we don't have so much so there see uh, he is asking me a very interesting question murti why is it that no action is being taken when law exists is it because there are no complaint see in india all of us know for everything we have a fantastic law but how do we monitor it there is you know there is such a gap between the theory and the reality how it is implemented 
we have a law for dowry you taking dowry is an offense and yet look at uh, you know the big fat indian wedding etc so it is something which uh, continues uh, uh, throughout you know so it is not that we don't have a law the devdasi act came in 1949 etc it is abolished from that time they were during the british period also there were lots of laws trying to abolish it and it's not that you know this complaint the mechanism is so weak to how do you monitor it so madam if you permit me i would like to conclude here okay good so i would good. like to thank uh, i would like to thank professor raika pandey ji for engaging us in an interactive discussion on sexual harassment in the light of recent uh, judicial pronouncement madam we look forward to some more sessions from you on these important issues Thank oh, you very much. Oh, good. I also enjoyed it. I think we started with sexual harassment and we discussed so many things. <laughs> okay. See you all. Okay. Thanks. Audience are requested to kindly join again at 3 p.m. for the third session. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.